Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, people are still logging in. Um, so while they're doing that, we're just going to go over some uh, some housekeeping type, uh, type stuff. Uh, our goal today is to take the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, and its requirements and how it will affect your designs and installation of drinking fountains um, and break it all down for you. Uh, keep in mind as I move through the presentation that the requirements I'm about to cover apply to much more than just fountains uh, as well um, as the fact that all of you have state and local laws to also adhere to some may be the uh, you know the future of the standard and others are uh, are not but all are important to follow uh, this webinar is going to cover our requirements at the federal level so to begin uh, that's my face. I'm Justin Dunn. I'm the product specialist and trainer for Haas. Uh, I cover all the education around uh, the ADA and ANSI standard for our emergency equipment as well. Uh, with me, uh, making sure this doesn't burn down in the background, is Nicole Dennison. Uh, she is our marketing manager. Um, and uh, as we move through the webinar, uh, all attendees will be on mute. Uh, for the presentation, uh, and after the presentation is complete, we'll have a Q&A answering as many of the questions uh, you've submitted as possible without taking up too much of your day. Uh, so feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar by using the questions section on the uh, control panel. Uh, all questions, if not answered during the Q&A, will be answered in a follow-up email that will be sent out post-webinar by Nicole. Uh, we will also be launching poll questions, uh, not many, uh, like four, I believe, uh, that we greatly appreciate your participation in. Uh, these, again, and always help us to continue to improve this product uh, for you. Uh, in that follow-up email, you will be receiving the following. Uh, you'll get the on-demand recording, uh, the presentation slides, and uh, additional support materials. Um, all that be sent out about 24 to 48 hours after the presentation will uh, conclude. Okay, uh, so to get started, just to give you a little history on Haas, uh, our founder, Luther Haas, thank you, Luther, invented the modern drinking fountain in 1906 and formed the Haas Sanitary Drinking Fountain Company in 1909 in Berkeley, California. Uh, given this, uh, and our company's history with hydration and innovation, uh, we thought we were pretty uniquely interest, uh, situated to present this information to you. So uh, Luther at the time was actually working as a sanitation uh, inspector for Berkeley uh, when he had the thought to invent a device that would prevent users from putting their mouth on the device used to take a drink. Uh, now public fountains before the first boulder head were typically like a, a running fountain or a spigot on the wall that sometimes had a cup attached via a chain that you would pick up, fill, take a drink, and drop. Uh, you could even get a fancy cup and a fancy chain to go with it. Um, the problem with this is that it's disgusting and it needed to stop immediately. And lucky for us, Luther Haas was around to do something about it. Uh, for today's agenda, uh, we're going to overview the uh, ADA legislation for drinking fountains, uh, our focus on drinking fountains, uh, common ADA installation issues, I've got plenty of those, and then ADA compliant drinking fountains and bottle filler installations. And then we'll, we'll wrap all of it up with a Q&A at the end. Um, I'll start answering questions. Any that I, again, that I don't get to, we will answer and then follow up with you uh, post-webinar. Okay. And to begin with, uh, let's get the first one out of the way. We'll start our poll question number one. Uh, Nicole, if you would, please. What is your role when it comes to drinking fountains? Okay, sorry about that. We're having some technical audio issues. Um, what is your role when it comes to drinking fountains? If not applicable, please do not respond. And we'll give you just a few more seconds here to submit your answers. All right. 
Thanks. That's fantastic. Thanks again, everybody, for uh, your participation in that. It, it really does help us out. Um, so moving on uh, to the history lesson portion of this webinar. Uh, so before I start throwing numbers at everybody and measurements at you, uh, first and foremost, the 2010 ADA standards are civil rights legislation, uh, not your run-of-the-mill standard. Prior to this standard, its inception, uh, access it, accessibility was a joke. Um, there were no teeth in any of the requirements uh, to, pro to provide access to buildings and grounds for an entire class of people that were being heavily neglected. So, uh, but thanks to people like Justin Dart, uh, the founder of Dart Industries and responsible for a few brands you may recognize like Duracell, Tupperware, etc. Uh, he was one of the biggest advocates for the movement and is often referred to as the grandfather of the ADA as he was disabled himself. Uh, alongside Mr. George H.W. Bush, who actually signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law on July 26, 1990. And uh, this new act granted reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities and prohibited discrimination, which was pretty terrible at the time based on disabilities. Um, so give it a Google, it's a pretty cool story. Um, this particular standard is enforced by the Department of Justice, which currently uh, gives the, the standard its, its teeth and its, its bite. So um, with all that said, uh, let's get, uh, let's start getting into it. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, Act 28 CFR Part 36, Title 3, regarding public accommodations and commercial facilities and its requirements are enforced by none other than, again, the Department of Justice. Um, Title III is going to be our focus. Uh, the following information are the key sections of the standard pertaining to drinking fountains and their compliance. Also remember that uh, Nicole is going to send out these slides to everyone after the presentation, so you can reference them later, so you don't have to go too crazy with the uh, note taking or anything like that. Um, so for those who are curious, uh, since I always get asked later, Title II covers state and local government. Title I has more to do with anti-discrimination for of disabled employees and employment. Okay. Moving on, uh, this section 36.403 gives us a list of priorities uh, when making alterations to provide accessibility in your facility. Uh, you'll notice that in this list, drinking fountain takes a pretty high priority, even over accessible parking. Uh, the entrance, routes, restrooms, public telephones, fountains, uh, as well as parking, storage, and alarms uh, are all pretty high priority items. Chapter 1, Section 102, uh, just lets us know that the document contains both adult and children's requirements based on the anthropometrics, or which is just a fancy word for measurements, uh, capabilities of the human body. Um, children are defined as age 12 or younger in the ADA. Uh, I've got some great examples later uh, on in the presentation for both adult and children's height dimensions uh, for both compliant and non-compliant drinking fountain installations. Uh, this is chapter two, this is our scoping requirements. Uh, this section explains that there is one fountain, typically a high side fountain, uh, if well, if there is one, that there must be two drinking fountains. So if you've got one, you've got to have two. Local building code determines the number of drinking fountains that must be installed based on occupancy. This simply states that there must be a high fountain and a low fountain. Uh, what most don't understand is that the low side fountain is not the only fountain that is designed for people with disabilities. The high side fountain is designed for those with bending and stooping disabilities that may have to utilize a walker, a cane, or crutches, and may not be able to physically utilize the low side fountain. So all encompassingly, drinking fountains aren't designed for uh, able-bodied people. Uh, they're both the high side and low side designed for uh, disabled. Uh, so if you're installing a single fountain in your facility or park, you must satisfy this ADA requirement and install a second fountain. Uh, so if your local building code says, hey, you need one drinking fountain based on this many heads in your facility, uh, ADA overrides that. You now need two drinking fountains, one high, one low. Um, and I'll go over more of those requirements later. I always get asked, when do I need a, a drinking fountain? 
Um, when do I have to provide access and things like that? And we'll go over that. Um, oh, one other note, they don't have to be next to each other. So if, if Again, you, you've got your one fountain. If it's requiring two, they don't have to be next to each other like in the photo. You can use a high-low situation like this. They're usually installed near restrooms, kitchens, and things like that. But you could put the high side fountain on one end of a drinking uh, or hallway and the other fountain on the other end. It, it doesn't matter so long as the, the requirements met for uh, like that level of the building. Uh, 211.3. Uh, is referred to as our 50-50 rule. Uh, and it just states that half of the units installed need to be high fountains and the other half need to be low fountains. So with what I talked about before, ADA or overriding the requirement for one drinking fountain, you couldn't install just two high drinking fountains. Um, where there's one, there must be two, one must be high, one must be low. So for example, if you were installing eight new fountains in your building, uh, you couldn't do five fa high fountains and only three low fountains. Uh, you have to provide four high and four low. The exception to this rule is where the number of fountains yields a fraction. Uh, in another example, uh, given the previous requirement, we'll assume that you have met the number of drinking fountains for the property and have decided to add another, giving you nine drinking fountains. The ninth fountain can be whichever you prefer. It can be a high drinking fountain or a low drinking fountain. It's entirely your choice at that point. Um, but that's the only exception to the 50-50 rules where we, we get that fraction. Moving on in chapter three, uh, we start getting into dimensional and mechanical elements. Uh, you're gonna hear me use the term elements a lot throughout the presentation. An element can be any of the devices that we're granting access to. Uh, this can be a drinking fountain, phone, fire extinguisher, baby changing table, etc. Uh, many of the measurements we're about to go over apply to all of these elements. Just remember that our, our, our primary focus is on drinking fountains, but this does apply to most elements. Okay, uh, time for the fun part. This is one of the most important measurements to remember um, and often uh, the cause for non-compliance. 305.3 uh, and 305.5 detail clear ground space to accommodate the wheelchair underneath the fountain, uh, allowing an approach that is unobstructed to the fountain, which is incredibly important. You must provide a 30 inch by 48 inch uh, clearance underneath the element, which is just larger than your typical adult size wheelchair, uh, giving the user clear space for the wheelchair and for their hands to maneuver into that space. Uh, especially if it's like in an alcove. So 30 inches by 48 inches, very important uh, numbers to remember. Here we have an example that really clearly demonstrates clear ground space in front of an element. Um, in this case, a telephone and a fire extinguisher. 305.5 explains the positioning of this clear ground space, allowing for either a forward approach like the one you see on the left or a parallel approach as you see on the right, either is perfectly fine. Now keep in mind, uh, the 30 by 48 inches going forward, uh, it is very frequently the, the cause for many <laughs> poor installations out there uh, and compliance issues. Remember also that there are minimum requirements. The more space you can provide, the better. Now when the element is in an alcove, like in the examples above, wheelchair users are going to need additional space uh, to maneuver and the clear floor space changes based on the depth of the alcove and for the type of approach. Um, so in our first example, uh, if an alcove is in place, our 30 by 48 inches becomes 36 by 48 inches when the depth of that alcove exceeds 24 inches. If it's under 24, uh, under 24 inches, we stick to our 30 by 48. There is an exception for California. We'll go over that a little bit later. As soon as that alcove exceeds 24 inches, we're at 36 inches wide by 48 inches. That's to make sure that we have enough maneuverability and uh, space for hands, arms, um, for maneuvering into that alcove. In the second, for a parallel approach, when the depth of the alcove exceeds 15 inches, then our clear floor space must be 30 by 60 inches, giving us enough room to turn into that alcove or back into that alcove 
Um, a shorter one would mean a lot more maneuvers uh, and changes in direction, and that's just not going to be a very uh, easy approach. Now, currently, only states that I'm aware of uh, require the use of alcoves, and uh, they are California and Texas. Uh, many other states have followed suit, but it just makes sense for these elements to be out there or out of the path of travel. Um, but we'll go over that uh, a little bit shortly. Uh, extending up from our clear ground space, our toe and knee clearance. So try to think of this clear area underneath the fountain or whatever element it is as a three-dimensional space. Uh, just like you see in the uh, illustration, you can see the gentleman's legs underneath the fountain, his toes underneath the fountain, clear, it's unobstructed, and, um, and he's able to access whatever that element is. Uh, obstructions in this yellow highlighted area are another uh, unfortunately common compliance issue. Uh, I've got some great examples we found later on in the presentation uh, for your viewing pleasure. This space must be clear and includes any space the victim's knees, um, et cetera, need. Uh, I get this question all the time, and uh, it does count as an obstruction. Like um, anything between their knees is not going to cut it. So like P-traps, uh, hanging phone books, or that kind of shows my age, or anything else um, that might be hanging down that could obstruct them from approaching the fountain. So nothing between their knees as well. And uh, okay, and on to poll question number two. Uh, Nicole, if you would please. Okay, which brands do you specify most or have in your facility? Again, if this is not applicable, please do not respond. All right, we'll just give you a few more seconds here to respond. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this. Thanks, guys. That's crazy, 100% Haas. That's amazing. <laughs> just, just kidding. Okay. Next, uh, we're going on to protruding objects. So 307. Uh, pertains to protruding objects and is primarily in place to protect another type of protected class uh, that we haven't touched on yet. So, and that class is the vision impaired. Uh, elements may only protrude into a walkway so much and must be located at certain heights, whether they are in an alcove or not. Uh, this is to prevent anyone in that walkway from running into these elements. So objects with their leading edge are what is defined as like the lowest point on the front of the element above 27 inches may only protrude a maximum of four inches into the path of travel. Uh, but so long as the leading edge of the element is at or 27 inches uh, or under 27 inches, uh, then this is considered to be detectable by a detection cane, according to the DOJ, Department of Justice. Uh, here's another one of my favorite illustrations that I stole and take credit for. On the bottom right, we see an object very similar to a drinking fountain. And so long as its leading edge is at or below that 27 inch line that you see there, uh, it can be detected uh, through the use of that detection cane early enough to be avoided and prevent potential injury. Uh, this fountain and any element so long as it's meeting the 27 inch requirement can protrude any amount into this space because it's detectable. The same rule applies for elements at or above 80 inches from the floor. This is considered headroom clearance and similar to the previous example can extend any amount into the space. Uh, but if you're taller than six foot, eight inches, then I'm sorry, it seems the expectation is that you detect these objects with your forehead. Uh, since these measurements were based on average human anthropometrics. Uh, on the left, we have an object sitting above 20 inches and below 80 inches, and as such, is not above headroom clearance and cannot be detected by a, a detection cane. Therefore, these objects may not protrude into the space any more than four inches, 
uh, unless it's a handrail, uh, which are allowed to protrude four and a half inches. So again, with drinking fountains in mind, we're thinking about that object on the right-hand wall on the bottom. It's leading edges within that 27 inches, and it is detectable. That is generally the case for, uh, for drinking fountains. Uh, now I'm going to use our, this is our 1011 HPS uh, and SK3 cane skirt uh, for this next example. This is a dual high-low unit, typically installed in high-traffic customer-facing areas because of its its mirror finish and swirl bowl. And it's a very fancy drinking fountain, um, and it's a perfect example of what your typical high-low ADA installation looks like. Uh, the SK3 cane skirt is what we need to discuss here. So where drinking fountains cannot be alcoved out of the path of travel or may not be required by the state, uh, a cane skirt must be used to lower the leading edge of the high side fountain to 27 inches um, to also make this side detectable. Um, obviously because it's not, the, the lower edge of that side of the drinking fountain is not at 27 inches. So when using a detection cane, uh, if unassisted, very important, you are generally following what is referred to as a shoreline or outermost edge of a space. Uh, since the vision impaired may need to detect something on either side of the room, uh, they may be traveling in either direction. And without the cane skirt in place, there will likely be incidents where people will run into the high side fountain, uh, which is why we use that cane skirt to bring the leading edge down. Uh, many states still don't fully utilize alcoves, and uh, until they do, cane skirts are they're the answer to this uh, this problem. Section 308 covers reach ranges, another important requirement when something like a bottle filler is installed or when things like baby changing stations are installed and things like that. This slide is uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if your reach is unobstructed, like in the photo on the left, then you have a high 48-inch max reach range and a low 15-inch minimum reach range. Any buttons, handles, sensors, et cetera, must be located within this range. Uh, but as soon as we introduce an obstruction, uh, our reach ranges uh, are diminished. So in the right two examples, um, when an object is shorter than 20 inches uh, and in place, we keep our 48 inch high reach range, but our low reach disappears since we now have the fountain or another element in place like you see in the center uh, illustration. When reaching over an object that is 20 to 25 inches, our high reach range is shortened. It's only 20 to, down to 44 inches. Generally speaking, drinking fountains are shorter than 20 inches, uh, like 18 to 20 inches. So the middle example will be what our reach ranges are going to be. Uh, usually, remember, um, we want to make things as easy as possible and not create a challenge for the disabled person, right? So um, drinking fountains, usually what you're going to see in that center in illustration on the right would be something, again, more like a baby changing table. And on the left, uh, something you'd want to consider for like a, a wall flush mounted fire extinguisher. Uh, this DOG uh, advisory defines reach ranges for children. Uh, it's based on range. Uh, remember, children are defined as ages 12 and under in the ADA. These reach ranges apply to both forward and parallel approach to an element. Uh, starting on the left, ages 3 to 4 have a high-low reach range of 36 inches to 20 inches. 5 to 8 have 40, 40 inches to 18 inches. And then ages 19 or 9 to 12 have a 44 to 16 inch reach. Uh, obviously, as they grow, their arm reach grows as well, uh, extending their reach. Ages over 12 are expected to utilize adult height drinking fountains. The only places you'll typically find these in, in use is uh, the school system, daycare facilities, and uh, the like where many children are supervised by fewer adults. Uh, in public, the expectation is that an adult is present to assist the child with the with using the drinking fountain or other elements. So it's not uh, always required or necessary in, in public spaces. In chapter six, we get into specifics regarding public elements and measurements. First off, 602.2 covers clear floor space and the necessity to have that clear floor space centered 
on the unit, not on the alcove. I have some examples of installations that miss the mark on this coming up. Uh, this is for a forward approach as a parallel approach uh, must be set up different. Uh, obviously, our toe and knee clearance must um, also be available. Now, there's an exception included here for parallel approaches to children's use units. Knee and toe clearance begins to diminish pretty quickly as we start lowering fountains for children's use. So the use of a parallel approach is really important. Uh, especially considering that children's wheelchairs are very frequently adult wheelchairs. Uh, custom size uh, child wheelchairs can be very expensive and they can pretty quickly outgrow them. Uh, so a parallel approach helps to uh, solve that issue. Here we have a really good illustration on the floors uh, of the floor space and how they must be centered on the elements as far as the fountain goes. Uh, since the clear floor space is intended for the wheelchair user, uh, it is centered on the left low side fountain. And since there's no real uh, floor space defined in black and white for the high side, the floor space can spill over under the high side fountain as, m as much as is needed. Uh, many make the mistake of centering the clear floor space on the alcove, which can lead to expensive tear outs and redesigns since the wall will start to uh, creep into our clear floor space underneath the low side fountain. Uh, here you can see we have a total uh, width of 48 inches in this alcove. It is not deeper than 24 inches, so we don't need to expand on our 30 inch floor space width. You will, however, notice that it is uh, it shows a separate measurement for California. Uh, in typical fashion, California strayed from the standard requirements and mandated an additional two inches of floor space, bumping up the width of our floor space to 32 inches. So long as state requirements go above and beyond, the federal standards, they can supersede them. Uh, to center the fountain in this alcove correctly, uh, which is not mandatory by the way, but is typically done uh, so that it's aesthetically pleasing, we would need 28, 28 inches total width of the alcove in California and 46 inches anywhere else. Uh, if the alcove was deeper than 24 inches, remember that we would need to meet a total of uh, 36 inches. So, uh, and that's of uh, the, the ground clearance centered on the low side. Center line to center line, these fountains are separated by 16 inches, which means we need an additional 18 inches of space on either side total to meet our 36 inch minimum for the fountain to be centered, okay? Which remember is not a requirement. Drinking fountains don't have to be centered in the alcove. It's, it's just for aesthetics. That high side fountain can be squished up against the wall so that we have our clear floor space underneath the low side drinking fountain. That's what's really important. Uh, since there are no obstructions under the high side fountain, our primary concern is that wall. Uh, so remember, if it is at all intruding into our floor space, the alcove would need to be redesigned or the fountain would need to be, again, shoved up uh, um, so that the high side is closer to the alcove wall, giving us a clear floor space centered on the low side. The fountain may be um, a little off center, though, but uh, it, it is what it is. We should remember that the high side is also for those with disabilities and they may need the assistance of walkers, crutches, canes, et cetera, and need to leave the, um, uh, and need to leave room for that equipment. So if we shove that high side drinking fountain up against that wall, we may be hindering that type, those types of devices from accessing the equipment. Uh, to be fair, again, there is an uh, agreed upon number for the high side floor clearance that I will cover later. Um, it's not required in the standard. It's just something that we have all agreed upon as far as space goes. Uh, next is poll question number three. Uh, Nicole? All right. What is the most important benefit to you or your clients when selecting drinking fountains? Okay, we'll give you just a few more seconds here to respond. All right, back to you, Justin. 
Thank you, Nicole. Moving on. Uh, this is an excerpt from the California Building Code and what they have done along with Texas and a few uh, other states that I'm blanking on at the moment uh, is they've made it mandatory to locate all drinking fountains in alcoves or within wing walls to ensure that uh, they don't impede into pedestrian walkways. Uh, these protected areas must be 32 inches wide and 18 inches deep minimum. Wing walls act like an alcove where an alcove, uh, alcove can't be installed or is retrofitted into place. Uh, the wing walls must also project horizontally as at least as far as the drinking fountain. Now, while we're on the topic of chapter six, uh, I should bring up that the flow of the fountain must also be within compliance from the equipment. The height of the stream uh, of water must be at least four inches to allow for a bottle or a glass to be filled for those who may be incapable of leaning over the drinking fountain. Uh, it also makes it a lot easier for someone to take a drink. Uh, so let's see here, time for some examples. Here we go. Alcoves are typically the issue. Uh, when we see non-compliance uh, or a drive-by lawsuit, it's usually the alcove that's in question. Uh, in this installation, we have the low side installed on the right side and a large gas line obstructing our toe and knee clearance underneath the fountain. Uh, this could be fixed. Uh, by just swapping the two fountains uh, so that the clear floor space on the left is being used with the low side fountain. So long as there is a 30 inches, or uh, so long as we have our 30 inches or 32 inches for California between the gas line and the wall on the left, and it's centered on that low side fountain, uh, then we'd be good. Next, uh -huh. so uh, here's another one. Uh, those tiles, behind the fountain are two inches, and we only have 12 inches on the left low side between the center of the fountain and the wall, which means we are not meeting our minimum clear floor space. The wall is sitting in our clear floor space, obstructing access for wheelchair users. Uh, again, we don't need to make this harder for anyone. Uh, these fountains could be repositioned further to the right in the alcove so that we have our floor space required under the low side. Uh, that would be the easiest fix, um, and again, we, we we don't need to make this any harder. Right? It doesn't take much um, obstruction or uh, uh, of a non-compliance for this to um, be a, a, a pretty big issue for somebody. So uh, here's a closer view of the issue. So from the wall to the center of the fountain, we only have our 12 inches uh, where we need 15 minimum to uh, meet our 30 inch requirement or 16 inches from the center line to the wall to meet our 32 inches for California. Reversing these again might also be a solution, but we have that pipe on the right side that uh, would obstruct our toe clearance. Um, so swapping them might not be the solution here. Here's another one. Uh, this example shows a high-low configuration with four inch tile in use behind the fountains. Uh, we can see that the center line of the low side fountain to the wall that we have only 14 inches, giving us only 29 inches of clearance, but that's enough to make this a very difficult approach. Uh, they may not have considered the thickness of the tile when they finished the alcove here. And again, they could move these over to bring them back into compliance unless they uh, want them centered too. Then they'll need to redesign that alcove. Uh, okay, back to children's use for just a moment. Section 602.2 gives us the maximum bubbler height of 30 inches and a three and a half inch maximum depth for the bubbler from the front edge of the fountain. This also allows us to forego our previously mentioned knee and toe clearance so that we can lower the fountain where the uses are intended to be children. Uh, there will be a uh, need to be a parallel approach and space for that available though. Many states have their own requirements for children's height and approach preference. So be sure to uh, reference those local requirements before pulling a, well, Justin over at Haas said so. Uh, many states don't allow for a parallel approach for children's fountains and require a front approach. Uh, some even specify their own knee clearance, so be careful. Uh, let's see here. Let's move on to a few more examples now that everybody is confused. Uh, so much wrong here. <laughs> um, their intention was to install a high low with a third child height fountain in a cascading design, but uh, it's unfortunately all mixed up. 
Uh, first off, our clear floor space and knee clearance is being obstructed by what they intended to be the child height fountain and should have been the ADA fountain. Not only is the fountain way too close to the wall, but a wheelchair is going to have trouble maneuvering to the fountain while hitting the left side fountain. Um, the high low unit should have been installed on the right with the single fountain installed on the left side with enough room between it and the, and the center fountain to meet our 30 inches. So here, I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll give you an example of how it's done. Um, I'm gonna use our 1501 and our 1311 for this example. Uh, these are enameled cast iron fountains. Uh, you would typically find these in schools and medical facilities. Here is basically the mirror image of the example I showed earlier, but compliant. The 1311 high-low unit is installed on the left as the standing and ADA fountain with 22 inches between the center line of the center fountain and the child height fountain, giving us plenty of room for our clear floor space. Uh, and I'll define that real quick for you on the screen. There you go. Uh, here you can see the outline of the 30 inches of space we need. The high side doesn't offer any obstructions underneath it. So we just need to ensure that the child fountain is far enough away that it doesn't interfere with the wheelchair. Center line to center line uh, would be 23 inches if we need to bump up our floor space to 32 inches uh, for California. If you didn't care about that cascading design of the fountains, uh, you could even just take the child height fountain and place it on the left side of the design then you would only need to ensure the wall to the right of the ADA fountain was far enough away, um, but the child uh, height fountain isn't going to do anything to our insulation on the left side of that high side. It would be uh, a little easier. Um, you just wouldn't have that cascading design, but it would be compliant. Uh, there are, I mean, a, a wide variety of fountains. Um, out there that can be used to meet these requirements. Uh, this one in particular is our 1107L. All of our fountains will come in um, is a single and dual installation design for adults, ADA, and child height designs. Uh, we also include all the drawings and installation considerations in the world, compliant equipment, even webinars like this one, but someone out there will still throw out the instructions and make uh, some poor compliance examples for me to use in my next webinar. Um, next, uh, let's do a few outdoor examples. Uh, this is our 3300 FR, it's a freeze protected unit. And the photo, I can just tell by the buttons on it. Um, and, and someone has installed this way too close to the wall there. Uh, you can see here that our floor space is obstructed. One might be able to pull off a hybrid parallel slash forward approach to get a drinking fountain, uh, to get a drink from the fountain, but we don't, uh, we don't wanna see people have to improvise to get a drink of water. Uh, this needs to be moved away from the wall. Uh, if a field inspector or just an informed disabled person were to find this, uh, it would mean a, um, a tear out and reinstall, which again can be very expensive. Uh, here's another example for outdoor compliance. This fountain, for example, was an adjustable arm that can be adjusted for either adult or child height uh, with the arm. Uh, it can be switched. Uh, these are incredibly common in public parks, especially because of their ability to accommodate both ADA and children. Uh, when installing these fountains, considering the approach and the direction of the bubbler head are important factors to uh, ensure compliance uh, during these installations. So uh, let's start with some compliant examples. Above, we have the 3150 installed. If the 3150 or any other outdoor fountain is installed against a wall, building, or railing structure, or whatever it is, the center line of the wheelchair accessible fountain needs to be a minimum of 15 inches from the wall. Uh, again, just to give us our 30 inches of clear ground space. And we'll, of course, need our 48 inches out from the base of the fountain to meet our 30 by 48 inches. Hopefully nobody's surprised uh, by this, but it doesn't take much to make it difficult to utilize drinking fountains from a wheelchair. Uh, so same as indoor installations, we need to have our available knee and toe clearance available underneath the fountain. Lastly, uh, I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but here's the visual representation of the clear space for the high side fountain of 30, 
30 by 30 inches basically. Um, you can see it right in front of the fountain, uh, front approach for standing persons, 30 by 30 inches. Uh, again, not required, but it is generally agreed upon that this space is necessary. Uh, and since it's intended for those with stooping or bending disabilities, then we need to assume that walkers or other devices may be used uh, and that they need a certain amount of space available to access the bubbler head as well. So your typical walker, almost 30 by 30 inches, uh, which is where that, that measurement comes from. Now, common practice in public parks is to typically pour a pad of concrete specifically for the fountain to help improve the fountain from the pedestrian walkway and give users a, a firm surface to stand on or for the wheelchair users, a firm surface for wheels to avoid the difficulty that dirt or grass would provide for access. Uh, in this example, you can clearly see the path of travel on the left side, which will provide easy access to the low side fountain. If the orientation of the fountain were any different in this exact layout, access to the fountain would be pretty difficult. Uh, to fit the fountain perfectly here, to include both the wheelchair free ground space and high side fountain space, we need a pad that is 69 inches by 52 inches, uh, deep and wide. With the low side, again, facing the path of travel for uh, an easy forward approach. Now, a uh, different example this time with wing walls uh, or guardrails in place instead. All requirements remain the same here for the approach. Still favoring a forward approach since it is the easiest, certainly in this type of installation. Unfortunately, many installations are, uh, prioritize the high side, uh, and I like to think unintentionally making the low side difficult to access, unfortunately. Uh, remember that the guardrails need to extend at least far enough so that no part of the fountain protrudes outside of the reach of the rails. This is all in an effort to make sure the unit is easily detectable and to keep it out of the path of travel. Uh, here's a short lineup, uh, some examples of some of the models uh, Haas offers to make compliant installation possible, uh, not to mention our ability to run specials to fit unique situations and areas. Uh, there's a solution for everything, and I'm pretty sure we can help you find it. Uh, just remember that the design of the fountain is going to typically be very important for your installation area, the traffic, and not to mention the type of facility or area that it is that you're making accessible. Speaking of options, uh, this is a newer offering that I'm going to use to demonstrate a few compliant configurations with. Uh, the great part of this particular fountain is that it is highly modular uh, and gives us the ability to easily adapt the fountain to different installations uh, with doing custom work. Uh, the arms, bowls, bottle fillers can all be indexed in any direction, giving us uh, some flexibility in the, uh, the installation and the design. So our 3600 uh, in this example is an it's in an ADA and child height configuration with a bottle filler in the center. Well within accept, uh, accessible limits, the bottle filler is uh, of course could be swapped out for a fountain uh, accommodating standing ADA and child heights in one fountain. Like in the example, we just need to make sure the fountain is far enough from any obstruction like this wall or fence to ensure we have our clear floor space. Uh, this giving us our forward approach from the right hand sign uh, or side. So you can see the uh, the forward approach there. We have our clear 30 by 48 inches there, and we are 15 inches from center line of the drinking fountain on the right side to the wall or fence, making this uh, perfectly ex accessible. Uh, for those who may not be aware, the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design were derived from the ANSI. A117.1-2009 standard. Uh, the updates that these standards last received included the addition of bottle filling stations to the drinking fountains, section 602, uh, as you see on the screen. Uh, 602.4 indicates that bottle fillers must adhere to 602.4.1 and 0.2 regarding clear floor space is what those are, uh, which again is 30 by 48 inches. So we have to have that same clear floor space for the bottle fillers. Um, and this also says that the controls need to be either hand operated or automatic to be within the reach ranges. Uh, I go over all that, I'll cover all of this in a moment. Uh, there is also an exception on this page stating that if the bottle filler is installed on both the high and low side fountains, then the high side fountain does not need to comply with this section at all. 
uh, which is due to the fact that our low side bottle filler is excessively installed. Uh, it's pretty rare to see an installation like that though, um, but with that in mind, if a bottle filler is not installed or, or provided for both fountains, which is generally the case, then the one bottle filler must be located on the low side uh, to allow access to wheelchair-bound people. Uh, since if the bottle filler is on the low side, we can ensure that everyone can reach it, and if located on the high side, we're going to make it access. We're going to make access pretty difficult uh, for people in wheelchairs. Two bottle fillers is perfectly fine, though, uh, especially in high traffic areas or where fountains are separated by some distance. Um, so no worries there. Last, we still need to ensure clear floor space and that the controls are within the appropriate range ranges, uh, whether a fountain is in place or not. Next up, I'm going to use our 1920 bottle filler uh, for the next few examples of compliance. These little devices are retrofittable uh, on our equipment and our, com our competitors' equipment, which makes them pretty easy when we're considering ADA installations. So remember the, uh, the product plug from earlier, the 1117. So here we have the 1117LN with our 1920 bottle filler over the low side fountain accessible to all well within our reach ranges. Uh, all we need to ensure here is that the button is reachable and that the activator is either hand operated or automatic. Now I know what you're thinking, Justin, what other kind is there? Um, but all they're trying to do with this verbiage is avoid like foot or knee or butt activation, whatever parts of the body that would be difficult to use for those in a wheelchair basically. Um, this needs to be as easy as possible. So hand activated or automatic, either is perfectly fine. Uh, even with all this said, I'm sure the standard will change. Uh, eventually we could, I mean, we could all still do a much better job. It's, it's easy for us. Um, we need to make sure it's easy for others as well. So in accordance with 308.2.2, uh, our reach ranges, um, the activation for the bottle filler is located at 46 inches, which is below the required 48 inches we covered earlier, as you can see up there on the right. You can see the button is 46 inches from the ground. Our max is 48 inches. We're within compliance. Um, remember, though, that this is a maximum height. And since it is a maximum height, the activator can be located anywhere between the fountain and the bottle filler just not below the fountain. Since we have an obstruction uh, to our low reach range, if there was no fountain installed uh, or no obstruction under the bottle filler, we could still install the activator as low as 15 inches based on the reach ranges, but that would also be pretty impractical uh, so and unreasonable. Um, remember that we get our 48 inches uh, reach here because the installed fountain is not exceeding 28 in, or 20 inches from the wall. Most fountains are about 18 to 20 inches. Again, uh, if any element was in place that fell into the 20 to 25 inch uh, range, keep in mind that our reach range goes down to 44 inches. Uh, but again, that usually applies to other types of elements. Uh, here's another common installation, uh, compliant installation. Uh, this is our 1501. This one's mostly popular with schools due to its, it has that white enamel surface, which is intended to you know, stay cooler. Uh, to prevent kids from burning themselves on a hot stainless uh, that has been sitting in the sun. Uh, it's especially ideal for outdoor wall-mounted ADA configurations since the fountain is often used to support the person getting a drink from a wheelchair. Um, I figure the more compliant installations I show everyone, the more likely we are to catch misses in public. Uh, and there's some pretty interesting ones, so I'll, sh I'll show you guys a few more. Uh, here we just have a single 1311 fountain. Uh, it could be used um, uh, pretty easily as our third child height drinking fountain or as a standalone ADA fountain. And guess what? Or a high side fountain, all depending on your facility, what needs it's trying to fill, et cetera. So whatever that insulation is type uh, is, um, generally, it's just the height insulation of the drinking fountain that obviously determines its, its accessibility. So speaking of child height, um, remember children are defined as age, again, 12 and under. So here, uh, we're utilizing the age range 9 to 12. Uh, our reach range maximum would be 44 inches, right? The bubbler head has to be at a maximum of 30 inches or below for a child height fountain at the spout. 
not the top of the bubbler head, at the spout of the water. So as you can see on the screen, our bottle filler activation is at 42 and 5 eighths inches from the floor, well below our 44 inch max, and the bubbler is at a 30 inch is at 30 inches, which is well within compliance. It's at 30 or below. Uh, this would obviously not do in an adult uh, ADA situation uh, unless it was raised. Um, since the fountain would be an obstruction to our knees, our, our knee clearance and the bottle filler would be pretty much unreachable since that fountain would keep hit our knees and prevent us from reaching it. Um, it would just need to be raised to fall into compliance for adult ADA. Uh, this is just an example with a different design in mind, uh, more of a front lobby look to this one. Uh, this would be a fully compliant 1011 MS and uh, a 1920 bottle filler given that the contractor plumber or whoever it is installing it read the instructions uh, not to mention that the architect designed the area correctly um, we all make mistakes uh, it happens um, Wade Haas can make the most ADA compliant fountain you've ever seen in your entire life provide the best customer service and tech support in the world and someone will mess this up uh, ultimately, it's it's really up to you to ensure that this is done correctly and that those with disabilities are kept in mind while you're doing it, right? Uh, so lastly, keep in mind that we are uh, we have chilling technology for the uh, for these units as well, uh, or HCR8 chiller can be remotely placed to supply a fountain with chilled water uh, while leaving the bottom of the fountain completely obstruction free. Uh, the more room, the better is what I always say when it comes to the ADA. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the Q&A section of our webinar uh, today. Remember to submit your questions. Any that I don't get to will be answered in that follow-up email that I mentioned. Um, I like to end with this photo. This is actually installed uh, right in our backyard at the Reno International Airport. And it's just a really great example of a high-low drinking fountain with the bottle filler installed correctly. It's alcoved, it's compliant. It's just a really uh, nice photo to end on. So keep an eye out uh, for those poor installations out there. Today was intended to make you as informed as as I could in my hour time limit. Uh, so hopefully everyone got something from this. Uh, even those familiar with the standard hopefully learned, uh, learned something new. Um, so right before we get to the Q&A, uh, we're gonna launch poll question number four. Uh, Nicole, if you get that going for us, please. Okay, last question of the day. <clears throat> what percentage of the time do you specify a bottle filler when specifying a drinking fountain? And please only respond if this is applicable to you. Okay, thanks for responding. I'm going to go ahead and close this and then jump right into uh, the uh, questions that we received throughout the webinar. Uh, just remember that um, if you do have any questions, keep putting them into the question box and we will either get to them now or uh, send out the responses uh, at the um, with the follow-up materials. So I'm going to just jump right in and so we've got our uh, FAQ, um, two really commonly questions um, that we um, that we get constantly uh, that we're going to cover real quick. Uh, so number one, does everything have to be ADA accessible? Uh, and the answer is nope. Uh, but you have to ask yourself this question. So does my building or business uh, have places designed for public accommodation? Uh, this can mean a lot of different areas, retail, restaurants, parks, airports, schools, apartments, and so on. Um, if the answer is yes, then you need to ensure that you have accessible routes and the elements of the building are also accessible. Remember that the private businesses are also responsible. So long as they have 15 or more uh, people employed, 
uh, but that does change based on a state on um, on state slightly so make sure you're checking your local regulations uh, there are of course areas and certain types of facilities where wheelchair access should be deterred uh, you don't need to make the cooling tower at your local power plant or wastewater treatment facility ADA accessible uh, just remember to think where have I given access and then make the appropriate changes from there. Um, the second on the list are uh, is our children's height fixtures required by the ADA and I usually get that a lot. A lot of people end up asking are children's fixtures in general required by the ADA and uh, yes um, and not just for fountains uh, but think about the customer um, daycares schools and the like uh, have mostly children and they need to have accessible toilets sinks and fountains uh, these requirements are not always the easiest to follow in the ADA they can be a bit confusing but they are required and future iterations of the standard will hopefully provide uh, better information um, than the current standard uh, but yes they are required generally where assistance from an adult is not available uh, we assume in public areas we'll have a, a parents uh, to rely on um, so it's uh, basically it's nice to see child height fountains in like public areas but it's not always required uh, which is why we don't see child size toilets in public spaces and things like that but so not generally required in uh, general public areas but in areas where uh, children may not be able to be assisted by an adult uh, again like child care day daycare things like that uh, you'd have to have those installed okay so and then Nicole if you would move on to question number one please all right <clears throat> first question are all people who have disabilities covered by the ADA uh, so there's a um, there's a lawyer answer to this uh, and it's it depends uh, all people who meet the ADA definition of disability are covered by the ADA in general um, but uh, they may not have the rights uh, under particular sections so a, a great example that I found is that uh, uh, there is a section of the ADA that deals only with employment discrimination uh, section one uh, if a person with a disability is not employed and is not seeking employment then that person would not necessarily be covered by that part of the ADA although the person would be covered by other parts of the ADA so it depends on what their situation is uh, what it is that they're they're actively doing um, when it comes to uh, installations of drinking fountains in public spaces uh, commercial buildings and things like that um, again just remember to what I spoke to earlier so long as there's been access given to those areas um, and you have people with disabilities on site all they have to do is ask um, and that's good enough uh, so long as it is reasonable to do the uh, changes need to be uh, made uh, okay uh, Nicole next question okay next question is is a bottle filler required for ADA fountains uh, that one's super easy so no uh, the bottle filler is it's an accessory it's not an, a, a requirement in the ADA require uh, in the uh, we're required to give access to it appropriately uh, but no building is required to have bottle fillers um, so once the requirements have been met for the minimum number of drinking fountains in your facility uh, then you can install as many or as little bottle fillers as you would like um, but remember that the bottle filler can never replace a drinking fountain in your facility uh, again it's just a, it's an accessory to the drinking fountain or other places in your facility okay great uh, does the ADA regulation override ANSI no it does not uh, so the federal access board um, has the authority to of course use uh, ANSI uh, as a foundation uh, just like OSHA does with ANSI or other um, uh, organizations do and they have the ability to modify them as they see fit 
um, to accommodate government, bu government buildings or for DOT uh, transportation, public transportation, commercial buildings, facilities. Um, but ultimately, every time the ADA standards are the law nationwide. It's a federal standard, it's civil rights legislation, and must be adhered to first. Okay. Um, is there a specific requirement for the type of actuation of the drinking fountain or water cooler? Okay. So uh, just re remember that uh, the activation, it has to be hand operated or it has to be automatic. Okay. Uh, this is in uh, section 309.4, which is under operation. Uh, all operable parts shall be operable with one hand and uh, shall not require tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist, uh, since this can be incredibly difficult for people with uh, disabilities. I wanna make sure we don't exclude them just from activating the equipment at all. Uh, so it cannot require those types of movements. Um, so, and the force required to activate the operable parts uh, shall be um, uh, five pounds maximum. Great. And uh, yeah. Okay, that's about it. Um, we are at uh, 11 o'clock, so I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. If your question did not get addressed, um, please be on the lookout for all of the Q&A to be sent out in the follow-up materials. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, so that's it for our webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we at Haas really appreciate your support. Uh, the follow-up email will be sent out soon please utilize the contact information on the page. Uh, if you have any questions um, and make sure to take what you've learned today and go forth and be champions for compliance. So thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.